Can we give God one more hand clap praise, huh? Uh, Holly, that, come on now. That's that type of praise. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, good evening. And God bless you, Shiloh and Kingdom family. Hallelujah. I got to say Kingdom family because we got Kingdom family from all different types of churches all over the place uh, on this 10-day shut-in. And so it's an honor uh, to salute you soldiers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Lord. I am blessed and excited to be here again. God has been showing out these last three nights. And we still got six more to go. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. After tonight, uh, this shut-in has been nothing short of a blessing. And if you've made time to be here in any capacity, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, I encourage you. As a matter of fact, I urge you. As a matter of fact, I plead with you. Get in here and experience this move of God, hallelujah. This time of consecration, this time of refreshing, this time of recalibration, this time of rekindling, it is absolutely necessary for where God is about to take us. Family, the word the Lord has put on my heart, there's a, uh, the Lord has put a word on my heart for you tonight. I'm here to build you up. I'm here to stir you up. I'm here to fire you up because the Lord wants his church to be on fire, on fire for God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on fire for souls, on fire for righteousness, because if we're not on fire, how in the world are we going to set others on fire? Huh? Hallelujah. Matthew 12, 20 says, the, says a bruised reed. He will not break and a smoking flax he shall not quench till he sends forth judgment to victory. This is acknowledging Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Messiah spoken in Isaiah 42. This passage is saying that there is a judgment coming. And in that judgment, he will have the ultimate victory as well as those that trusted in him. Come on. But if you are a bruised reed, if you are a bruised reed, reed, weak and wounded, damaged and beat down by the world, Jesus is not here to deliver the final blow that breaks you. Rather, he came to seek and save, to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up your wounds, to bring deliverance to those that are oppressed and afflicted, to give sight to the blind and rest to the weary, to give light to those that are lost in darkness, to give hope to those that are hopeless and life to the lifeless. He came to redeem and he came to restore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's also saying that if you're that smoking flax, that smoldering wick, that believer that's daunted and discouraged, holding on for dear life to a tiny glimmer of hope, a faint flicker of faith, he, his desire is not to quench you. He's not here to extinguish the ember, but to put some oil on that thing so that it can burn bright again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to be on fire. And I want to be like that fire on the altar that burns continuously for God. That fire represented the presence and the power of God. The Shekinah glory was visible in that fire. That fire was started by God when it came down from God and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions that the priests put on the altar as they were instructed to. I want to present my body, a living sacrifice, pleasing and acceptable to God. My question to you is, do you want to burn for the Lord? Do you want a fresh fire? Then give God a praise like you love him and need him and know 
Is he worthy? Yes. Well, I don't think that's enough. Hallelujah. Can we give him a praise that he's worthy of? Hallelujah! 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 Jesus! for the gift of preaching. I thank you for stirring up this hunger in me, this fire in me, and I want more. We want more. Lord God, help us to decrease so that you can increase in our lives. Lord, be glorified, Lord God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, let your word have free course in this room in this building, in our hearts, in our lives, Lord God. Guard our hearts and our minds from corruption and error. Anything that's not of you, from you, by you, or for you, we cancel it now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you. We thank you for everything you are, everything you do, and everything you've done. We give you the praise that only you deserve. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Family, tonight it's on my heart to talk about the good fight of faith. How many of you know that you have to fight for this faith? How many of you believe that this faith is worth fighting for? See, we can't, be, we can't afford to be passive in this family. We have to fight because the devil, the world, and the flesh is fighting against us every single day. We are on a battlefield. 
We are in the middle of a war zone, and we got to understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places, according to Ephesians 6, 12. If you don't understand this, you'll be fighting the wrong battles with the wrong enemies and fighting with the wrong weapons. You'll think it's the white man, or you'll think it's the black man, or you'll think it's the rich man, or you'll think it's the poor man, or you'll think it's the Democrat or the Republican, or you'll think it's the Muslim or the atheist or the Satanist or the scientist. All the while the real enemy is laughing while he's pulling the strings. The devil and his demons are the ones slapping you in the back of the head and pointing at your neighbor so you'll fight them about it. Do not be deceived. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9 tells us be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast or standing firm in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished or experienced in your brothers that are in the world. The devil wants one thing out of you, family. He wants your faith. He wants you to give up on God, to turn your back on God. Satan was the one speaking through Job's wife in Job 2, 9, saying, curse God and die. She said, why do you retain your integrity? In other words, she said, why are you staying faithful and committed to God when he's allowing you to experience such pain and suffering? Why don't you just turn away from God and allow yourself to be corrupted? Stop fighting and just give in to sin. Give in to unbelief. See, the ultimate sin is not trusting God. Because if you're not trusting God, Guess who you're trusting? But Job said to her in verse 10, you speak as one of those foolish women speak. Ignorant, not knowing what's really happening. He said, what, shall we receive the good at the hand of God and shall we not receive the evil? Meaning God gives and God takes away. Everything that we've been given, God has to take away at some point in time. It's all on loan to us. So if we trusted God to give it to us, shouldn't we trust God when he says time is up? We should trust him no matter what. And it goes on to say, and he, in, in all this, he, Job did not sin with his lips. Watch your mouth. In Matthew 12, 37, Jesus said, I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. It's what we say out of our mouth that shows what we believe. We have to be careful as Jesus was, as, as God was telling Zechariah that his son was coming. The angel had to mute him so that he couldn't speak against what God was about to do. And oftentimes we speak against what God is about to do. Rather, we should just say, let your will be done. If we can't say anything, if there's a shadow of doubt, say, let your will be done. Luke 22, 31 through 32, we see Jesus speaking to Peter. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan has desired to have you, 
that he may sift you as wheat. I believe this same scenario happened when Satan approached God for Job. And God presented to him and, and Satan desired to have Job. And in the same way, Satan desired to have Peter. In the same way, uh, uh, temptations and trials come where Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And when you sift wheat, that which is light falls through, but that which is heavy remains. Often done in a winnowing fan. And, and, and what Satan wants to do is to sift you that the wheat will, that the faith would remain and that you would blow away. But Jesus said, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you are converted, not if you are converted, hallelujah. If you belong to Jesus, and the word says that he ever lives to make intercession for us, hallelujah. If he's praying for you, just know you're going to pull through. And he's praying that your faith does not fail. The word says that if you're his and the father gave you to him, he will raise you up and he will lose none but raise you up at the last day. Hallelujah. So when he said, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. Why? Because when we go through these trials and tribulations, when we deal with these things and we make it through to the other side, when somebody else is going through something, we're supposed to give that testimony. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So we declare to them the goodness of God and the promise that he's gonna keep us and carry us through if we stand firm in the faith. Don't waver, don't shake, don't turn, but stand firm. See, the enemy knows the word. He knows that Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that seek him diligently. Number one, if you don't believe God exists, you won't come to him. You won't turn to him. Number two, if you, uh, uh, you won't put any effort into seeking him because you don't know, uh, know that he rewards those who really want to find him. Those who are really willing to press in until they get a touch from God. Are you willing to press in until you get a touch from God? Yeah. Yeah. With the issue of blood or like blind Bartimaeus crying out on the side of the road. Even when people told him to shut up, he cried all the more diligently. In both situations, Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. They found out that there's a blessing in the pressing. Have you found out that there's a blessing in the pressing? Have you ever been in a situation where you had to press and press and press and reach and fight and go until you get him? Yes. Until you get his attention. Jeremiah 29, 13, the Lord said, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. Yes. Same thing he said in Deuteronomy 4.29 in more or less words. Why? Because if you don't really trust God, you're not really going to press into him. If you don't think he has something more for you, you're not going to ask for more. You're not going to seek for more. You're not going to press for more. But he has more for you. We haven't even seen a portion of what God has for us and what God wants to do in and through us. Deuteronomy 4, 30 and 31 says, when you are in tribulation and all these things have come upon you, 
even in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient to his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. See, trials and tribulations expose the hearts of men and reveal what they actually believe. The children of Israel in the wilderness, all they did was complain and curse and doubt and gripe. Out of the abundance of their heart, their mouth spoke and it exposed their unbelief. And Hebrews 3.19 tells us that they could not enter into the rest because of unbelief yes. or because they did not believe. And Hebrews 4, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest by any means you should seem to fall short of it. There's a promise that we still have to hold on to. There's a promise that we still have to believe. And us making it into the promised land hinges on us believing that promise. If we don't want to fall short of that. Verse 2 says, for to us was the gospel preached as well as to them. But the word preached did not benefit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They heard it, but they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it, and they didn't walk in it. And they didn't walk in it, so it didn't get them to where they were walking to. True, true. They were all led astray, they were all misled because they didn't trust and obey the voice that was calling them to the other side. Family, we gotta fight for what we believe in. Because if we don't believe, we won't fight. In Mark 5, 36, Jesus said, do not fear, only believe. In John 14, 1, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. Do not let the lies of the enemy knock you off course. Keep on fighting. Yes. Keep on fighting. Yes. This passive Christianity will not stand the tests that are ahead of us. One brother in Christ says well when he says casual Christians will be casualties. These are the ones that fall by the wayside, having no root in themselves, offended by the persecution and afflictions and tribulations, and they fall away from the faith. These are the ones among, uh, among the thorns that become unfruitful, choked out and carried away by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. These are the increasing stories of apostasy and deconstruction that we're seeing left and right as they're leaving the faith and embracing a spirit of antichrist. In 1 Timothy, Chapter 6, verse 12, Paul exhorts Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Yes, fight the good fight of faith. Yes. Lay hold onto eternal life. We're pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The word says we haven't apprehended him yet. We haven't grabbed him yet. We haven't caught him yet. We got to keep pursuing. We got to keep pressing. And Paul is telling Timothy, keep pressing, keep fighting until you hold on, until you catch eternal life. There's a day that we're going to catch up to him, where we're going to get to hug him and hold him and embrace him. That time is not yet, but faith
faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We can see now as if it was that moment and we can hold him in the spirit like we will in the flesh, like physically in our glorified bodies. But Paul tells Timothy, you got to fight. You got to fight and lay hold onto eternal life whereunto you are called and have professed a good faith, a profession before many witnesses. Yes. We've made our declaration. We know in whom we've believed. And we know that he's able to keep that which we've committed to him until that day. Come on. But we got to stand on that. Yes, yes. We got to stand firm in that yes. and not move. Amen. This is after Paul warns Timothy of men that are coming to corrupt and confuse and subvert and divide and deceive the flock with the doctrines of demons and seducing spirits that he spoke about in chapter 4. Paul is teaching this young believer to fight for the faith and teaching this young pastor to fight for the flock because the wolves are coming. As a matter of fact, the word says that the wolves might even come right up out of your flock. Are you willing to fight? Are you willing to fight? We have to ask ourselves every day, are we willing to fight? Are we willing to fight for our children? Okay, because the enemy is fighting for them. Okay, the enemy is fighting for them every day. And it seems like he's gaining ground. Are we willing to fight for our children? Are we willing to fight for our marriage when everything comes against it? Are we willing to fight for our spouse when it seems so easy to lift up your hands and surrender and just let it go? Is it worth fighting for? Is it worth waiting for? Is it worth denying yourself for? Is it worth telling yourself no when you want to leave and when you want to find every excuse to go? Are you willing to fight? Are we willing to fight for our family and our friends, the lost ones that can't fight for themselves or don't even know that they need to fight for themselves? Are we willing to fight or are we willing to take the first no that they say? We tried to preach the gospel to them. We tried, tried to tell Jesus, tell them about Jesus and they pushed us away. They rejected us. They didn't want nothing to do with us. So we just cut them out of our lives. Are we willing to fight for them? Are we willing to cry out for them? Are we willing to try and try and try again? Because as long as they're alive, they have the opportunity to get saved. Don't get brokenhearted or upset when somebody rejects you. Jesus said if they rejected you, they rejected me, and they rejected him that sent me. But if they woke up today, God didn't reject them. If they woke up today, it's not over. Yes. Are we willing to fight for our community, for our city, for our nation, for our state? Are we willing to fight? Are we willing to fight for the unborn? Are we willing to fight for the fatherless? Are we willing to fight for those that don't have a voice and can't fight for themselves? Are we willing to fight for them? Yes. Are we willing to fight for ourselves? Or for our health, rather? Are we willing to fight for our health when the doctor says you got diabetes? Are you willing to fight for yourself when the doctor says you're not gonna make it? Are you willing to fight when the doctor says it's too late, it's over? Are you willing to declare, are you ready to declare the word of the Lord until the Lord says that it's time's up? Until the Lord says, no, I'm taking them home. Until the Lord says, nah, it's over. Are we willing to fight? Are we willing to fight for our peace? 
when everything in the world is fighting against it? Are we willing to fight so that we can be at rest and at peace on that boat, on that ark as Jesus was? Not worried about the, the winds and the waves and the threats of this world because we know that at best it can usher us into glory. Are we willing to fight for our peace? that passes all understanding when everything tries to lie and tell us that it's, it, it's darker than it actually is. How can it be so dark when we are walking in the light? How can it be so dark when the light is within us? How can it be so dark? Are we willing to fight for our joy? That everlasting joy, that joy that, that doesn't go away when you can't pay your bills and when you're struggling to, to breathe, when you're going through these issues, when all these things I just brought up are all up in your face. Are you willing to fight for that joy when your flesh says it's scary and you say, but I trust God? When your flesh says that mountain is big, that giant is big, but you say my God is bigger. Are you willing to fight? Are you willing to fight for your joy? Are you willing to fight in prayer? Are you willing to fight in fasting? Are you willing to fight and the lament and travail in the midnight hour in the spiritual warfare? Are you willing to fight your flesh? To beat it into subjection, to wage war against the fleshly desires that are contrary in waging war against your soul. Are we willing to fight? Be encouraged, family, because we don't fight alone. We don't fight alone. God fights for us. God fights in us. God fights with us as long as we don't fight against him. That's all you gotta do is not fight him. When he speaks, don't say, but, 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 but. Say, hey, your word says. Your word says. God said, can these dry bones live? He said, you know. You know. You got some dry bones in your life that God's asking you whether it can live? Tell him he knows. And I'm going to trust you in it. Amen. But as long as I'm here, I'm going to fight for it. Yes. It's God who fights for us. Yes. When we're overwhelmed, we cry out like David in Psalm 35, 1, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive against me or with me and fight against them that fight against me. Crying out like David in Psalm 56, 2, my enemies would daily swallow me up, for they are many that fight against me, O Most High. As we declare the word of the Lord and the spirits oppose us, allow the Lord to comfort you like he did with his words in Jeremiah 119, saying, they shall fight against you, but they shall not prevail, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. As we stand for God, he'll stand for us. As he says to our enemies, what he said in Jeremiah 21, 5, I myself will fight against you with an outstretched arm, or with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. As he declared in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord shall fight with you and you shall hold your peace. Stand your ground. Stay planted and I've got you Deuteronomy 130 which says the Lord your God which goes before you he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes he fought for Egypt or for 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 Israel he fought for the children of Israel and he's fighting for us in the same way. Yes. And we are in his son. We are in Christ. How much more will he fight for us? 
And again in Deuteronomy 20 verse 4, for the Lord your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. If God is for you, who can be against you? Do you believe in when he says the gates of hell shall not prevail against you? Do you believe when he says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? We just have to fight like the Lord fights. We fight with the word. Revelation 2.16, Jesus said, repent or else I will come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Declare like Jesus did in the wilderness, saying, it is written. It is written. Every time the enemy tempted him, every time the enemy challenged him, he said, it is written. In order to do that, you must know what is written. Believe only what God says. Let God be true and every man be a liar. I don't care if it's your mom, I don't care if it's your cousin that you looked up to your whole life, I don't care if it's your pastor or your bishop, if it's something contrary to the word. Believe what God says. Stand on what God says. I don't care who it is, don't take my word for it, don't take anybody's word for it, because none of us are standing before the judgment seat with you. You have to give an account for your life, what you believed. Stand on what God says, let God be true and every man be a liar. At the end of it all, we can say like Paul did in 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Why do you think he had to acknowledge keeping the faith? If it wasn't something he had to do. If it was something that he could have done, you know, way back on the road to Damascus, I had this encounter with Jesus and, and I'm saved. Yeah. You know, now I can go about my own way and do what I want to do and live my own life. Yeah. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished my course and I've kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only me, but to all them that love his appearing. And as he's leaving his final charge, at the beginning of that chapter, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, he says, I charge you. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant or ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long long suffering and doctrine. We have to know the teachings of the Lord, we have to know the teachings of the word and we have to be willing to stand toe to toe as long as we need to until that battle's up, until that battle's over, until that enemy flees, we have to stand on the word and declare and preach the word of the Lord with all long suffering and doctrine. Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. Everybody's not going to fight this fight. Everybody's not going to stay steadfast in the faith. A lot of us, a lot of people, a lot of believers are going to look for a way out, or they're going to look for an easier way. They're going to look for a broader way. They're going to look for a way that doesn't doesn't expect so much out of us. They're going to look for a way that, that they can hold on to their sin and still go to heaven. They're going to look for a way to make God in their own image 
rather than allow him to make him, them into his image, in the image of his son. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to find teachers that will come right along and say, yeah, you know what, you're right. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm not going to judge you. Matter of fact, come over here and do it at my house. And if anybody says anything to you, you say, judge not lest you be judged. Jesus said, don't judge. That's, that's what they'll say. Their teachers will gather them up and turn them to every dream and wish that they can want to pursue. And they're going to find out that it's at a dead end because it was a dead road by a dead God and not the real living God. He says, but watch in all things and endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of your ministry. Once again, this is not an I did that once faith. It's a continuous faith all the way to the finish line. We got to fight the good fight of faith day in and day out, sun up to sundown. First Corinthians 15, one through two. Paul said, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. He's saying you're standing in the word, the gospel that I gave you, by which you are saved if you keep in memory what I preach to you unless you believed in vain, unless you never believed. He's saying, you're going to remain there. You're going to stand there. You're going to keep it in memory. But if you go away and you forget, it's over. You're not in the faith. Hebrews 3.14 says, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Just as much as you believed in him on day one, you got to believe in him on the last day. And he said that he will raise you up at the last day and he will lose none. Brothers and sisters, will you fight the good fight of faith? We must fight the good fight of faith and we must fight every day. And I got to tell you, the word says that he already gave us the victory. Yes. Thanks be to God for the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give him a hand clap praise. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Family, I pray that you were encouraged today. I pray that you were reignited today with a fresh fire and a fresh desire to fight, to fight, to fight. Hey, this is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to ShilohHub.org. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.